it's an honor to be here and thank you all for coming in this cold but beautiful day. Welcome. Uh, I would also like to thank Bob Perry from Scott Carver for sponsoring this awesome talk. Now, before I start, I would like you all to close your eyes and imagine yourself in the future as far as you can go. It's 5 p.m., you're finished working, you hop on your drone and you fly back home, where you land on your balcony. Shopping has already been done by your robot butler and you sit to enjoy a 3D printed meal. Actually, it's the Heston Blumenthal recipe downloaded in the morning. After dinner, you just decide to change the mood and you want to go back to your holiday resort in Bahamas and you just whisper this to the room. The walls turn into a beautiful scenery instantly. Now open your eyes. Welcome back to 2016. So what you just experienced seems a bit far-fetched but with at the rate of things going today it's not so much so. And the title of my talk this evening is Colliding Worlds, Health, Well-Being, Design and Built Environments. It's quite a mouthful. I was trying to cram everything in. I should have said a smarter life. So before I start, a bit about me. Why do I talk about these things? This talk is my observations and thoughts through the lenses of the three hats that I'm wearing. The first one, the industrial designer. I graduated a while ago uh, from METU as a faculty valedictorian and while still a student I was working in Switzerland in a ceramic factory and I have a few design awards along the way. My second hat, the academic. For 25 years I've been in academia. I'm an associate dean of education but an associate professor in industrial design. And I, as Helen said, teach design research, design and emotion. But I also do research in aging. And one of the projects I'm involved in as a chief investigator is working, co-designing the bathroom of the futures with old people. And my third hat is the one of a carer. Uh, for the past eight years, I have been caring for my husband, who is struggling with a neurodegenerative disorder. So. That was a bit about me and my interest in these areas. And also I need to explain what I mean by collisions. So for me, it's impact, but not a simple impact. Collision is when things come together and they start shaping each other. So the collisions I will be talking about today are the physical real world colliding with the digital and the virtual, but also health and well-being colliding with materials and technology, and then our emotional responses and behavior colliding with the cumulative complexity of everything happening around us. So they are really impacting everything around us. And I'm going to talk about these in the following areas. But what I would like to achieve tonight is to send you back home engaged with the following areas, but also well, I should tell you what the areas are. Well-being is the first one, of course. Healthy life is the second. And I will talk about the fourth industrial revolution. I would like to send you back home a little bit more aware, empowered, curious, and hopeful about the future. Towards the end, we will have time for questions and comments. But let's start with well-being. So the study of well-being has two main perspectives. One is the eudaimonic perspective, which is also called objective well-being. And it deals with personal growth and living life to its fullest in a meaningful way. The second perspective is the hedonic one, which is also called subjective well-being, which deals with happiness, positive emotions, and avoidance of negative emotions. So most research will be around the hedonic perspective. 
but well-being in very brief is very subjective we can only get a sense of how we are going in life and this happens through our inter interactions with our circumstances our activities that we choose to do and also our psychological resources and you can see the many bubbles that affect well-being some more important than others and there is a lot of place for design to play a role but things turn around meaningful experiences experiences for us as human beings how important are experiences apparently they are very important because they help us create meaningful moments and they are more important than age gender education beauty health material wealth we are experiencing life as we go and remembering meaningful moments and this happens at an emotional emotional intellectual spiritual and physical level and actually these are the four quadrants of the Indian medicine wheel and I thought that was quite nice and we seek happiness as human beings that's what we are after happiness meaningful moments and just to quote Aristotle here he said happiness is the meaning of life the whole aim and purpose of existence but can we design for happiness can designers promote or induce happiness according to Sonia Lubominski happiness is 50% genetical 40% set by the intentional activities that we decide to do and 10% circumstances so design can play a role in the big 10% but also in the 40% by helping us do our intentional activities much better according to Van Hout design cannot directly produce happiness but can be the conduit for happiness it can be an expression of happiness And if you think about most of the things around us have been designed, this really puts design in a very powerful position to impact our well being. That was for the percentages. How could we do that? Of course, there are some very obvious design elements that all designers would use putting fun into the things we do will increase positive emotions cuteness is something we all relate to um, who can resist a baby's smile who doesn't want to protect a baby um, familiarity we all seek for familiar circumstances familiar things familiar people and color has been used all around the world to enhance mood and ambiences but these are very physical visible design elements but we can also be more subtle but would that apply to everybody in the same way would all of you react the same way to each of these solutions if they were provided to you so that brings to my mind the question about the average user would that be someone like that or if we had to describe a perfect user with uh, the navigation skills of a bat the memory of an elephant, visual acuity of an eagle, the stamina of a camel and dexterity of a monkey sometimes things are very hard to operate we will look a bit like this <laughs> so it wouldn't really work for none, none of us but this was to say that to be able to understand the many differences among you here one needs to empathize and to empathize one has to immerse themselves in the lives of people and that's what designers do designing with empathy there are many many design research methods that allow you to dwell into the lives immerse yourself and really helps you understand the user at the center of everything and there are many 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 different user groups as much as you as many as you can imagine and one of them is all people one thing about empathy is that you can't have judgment when or be judgmental when you empathize you should never actually be judgmental or have any assumptions about any of the user groups 
For example, these old ladies, they seem to enjoy themselves with whatever they're doing on the laptop. So <laughs> people might think that old people are scared of technology, would never use it, wouldn't be comfortable. Actually, that's not true. They just need to be exposed to it. They come from a different generation. They just need to catch up. And trust me, they catch up very fast when you show it to them. So how would a situation without any empathy and only concentrating on individual design solutions look like? That would look a bit like this. Trying to provide an individual solution for each problem will be a chaos of solutions and really not enhance the well-being of that person. And I'd like you to remember that human beings adapt to almost anything, even bad design. And I'm sure tonight many of you suffer from back pain. Can I see a show of hands? It's a big number. It's because we've never been designed to be seated, or yet we're spending our lives sitting. We adapted to it. So the human body is so malleable and fragile, we have to remember that. And if we think, what could be an extreme user adaptation, adaptation case? <coughs> what would that look like? I have one for you here. There's no way of preventing something like this. Someone might decide to carry their phone in this way, and this is a specific user group. And how can you design for that specific user group? Would that be ever possible? Yep. So this is a hearing aid. It's a sophisticated hearing prosthesis that has been designed especially for that user market. And it's an alternative piece of jewelry. It's beautiful. <laughs> and not just that, it just brings disability to a completely different level. Now you can be proud. You can say, can you see me here out loud? Which is the slogan. So it's about how people perceive themselves. It's closely linked to the emotions they are feeling. So you can feel proud with a product like this. But how do we physically process emotions or, or even get to feel them? Very, very briefly, we use our five senses, our brain, our heart, and our nervous system. They all collaborate. And our powers of associations, they play a great deal for us to translate the perception of things happening around us. But emotions are quite personal, so you would all here have different perceptions about where we are. And it brings me to a quote from Damasio who says, uh, humans are not thinking machines, they are feeling machines that think. So would there be any common human emotions? There would. These are the six common facial expressions that we can all read in people. And when I say all, every culture, every country, every age group, every religion will understand them. As human beings, we have quite predictable behavior patterns. And one of them is face recognition. We do recognize faces all very well. So, uh, and I would like to test the ability with you here. So I will show you an image upside down and I will ask you to recognize the person. <coughs> Anyone knows who she is? Angelina Jolie. Actually, it's not really her because when I turn her up, the eyes and the mouth are upside down, but your face recognition was kicking in and you just made up for whatever wasn't working. It's very ingrained in us. We recognize faces everywhere and even in objects where they are not. And this is a whole book called Face to Face by Francois and Jean Robert. They just go around and pick pictures of faces. So we are very good at that. And I talk about technology too. So how are computers and software competing with us in that realm? They are getting pretty, pretty well. This is um, Microsoft Project Oxford. It's a web-based system. When you upload images, it gives you the percentages of the emotions you are feeling at, the, at that moment. So this is for images, but it also works for video. 
So can you imagine you're having a Skype conversation with a client and you can see how they are feeling as you're talking to them. Oh, say, oh, okay. So you can avoid difficult or whatever conversations. They are getting pretty good. Can you imagine this coupled with devices, what it will do for your interaction with the device? So would that apply as well to human voice and vocal <coughs> intonation? Yes. So now they are. Um, Beyond Verbal is a company that has some emotion analytics technology and this is an app called Moody's that uses that technology and it works in real time so you can talk to it. The only problem is that it's one person at a time. You can't have a group chat. It will pick for one person your vocal intonation so it doesn't matter which language you speak. It's the tone of your voice that matters and it gets it pretty right. So imagine this combined with the face emotion recognition. Your products are going to say to you, you're having a very bad day today. Would you like me to turn on the kettle for a coffee? <laughs> it's going to happen very soon. So now I have an activity for you. <laughs> I would like to test with you yet another innate human ingrained thing that we have, we have in us. So I'd like you to pair in twos. So you have to find a partner. Some people already have a partner, they're lucky. Okay, it's a bit intimate, a little bit, not much. Okay, so what I would like you to do, <laughs> I would like you to raise your left hand like this. And first, with your right hand, you caress your left hand slowly. And what I want you to remember is how soft it feels. Concentrate on how soft it feels. Okay, plenty. Now do it to your partner on their left hand. And concentrate on how soft it feels again. Sorry for those who are too far. <laughs> Okay, so, can I have a, now a show of hands for those of you who think that your neighbor's, your teammate's hand, skin was softer? Okay, and now those who thought their own skin was softer? Ha! Ah, that is good, because this is exactly the same results that Fotopolo got from UCL. They did research on this, and this is called the social softness illusion. <laughs> Whether the skin of your team member was softer or not is not the point. The point is, it's ingrained in us, and this is to force us to build social relationships. We are a social human being. We can't live on our own. So think about all these things when we are going so fast into a digital world. We need human touch so much. So yes, uh, oh, going back. The grass always looks greener on the other side of the fence and yes, other people's skins always feel softer. <laughs> yeah. So this brings me to the need for hugs. Yeah, hugs. So emotional design revolves around the need for human beings to bond and create relationships. We create relationships with everything, with, with people, but also with objects, with cars. Our car, all our cars had names. I don't know if anyone here has names for their cars, but ours had. Um, but a hug is a positive exchange of energy. And there's serious research done on hugs, really serious research. And, uh, and this is from a child uh, psychologist, she says, a family therapist, she says, children need four hugs a day for maintenance, eight hugs a day, sorry, four for survival, eight for maintenance, and uh, 12 for growth. And uh, hugging, apparently, not apparently, research results show that re it reduces um, stress hormone release in the body and also high blood pressure. And it increases oxytocin release. So it's feel good hormone, so why not hugging? And again, think about all these things when we become more and more digital and unconnected with physicalities. So yes, our human need to bond, 
also to devices and machines. And how it functions with our perception, 80% of what people see is behind their eyes, means that really um, what we see, we, we are very, our eyes see things a lot, but we perceive them differently. There's, sometimes we can't really feel and touch things and the sound is not always coming with it. On top of that, our human attention span is finite. So when you demand attention from us in one place, we lose it in another. You must have seen all these illusionist tricks. On, that's how it works. Our attention span is finite. So that's how we perceive most of the things around us. First, we see how they look like. Then the feeling, this is a bit squishy. And the sound, I just get a feedback from the sound from the material, but it wasn't intentionally designed. Usually sound is a throwaway in products. So what would be an industry where sound is the main, one of the main things in it? The film industry is, is using sound to really take you with the story and tell you where to have a palpitation and where to be scared. And, and they've measured it. It's in, uh, in The Revenant with Leonardo DiCaprio. I, I still have to watch it. They, they have the whole audience of the movie theater wearing special devices, measuring their uh, bio, it's, it's, it's called crowd biometrics, and they were measuring their heart palpitation and how they were you know, feeling. And it's amazing what you can see, <laughs> where people go through in a movie. And sound has a very big role to play in here. So how would that look like if we were to measure mood? This is an example. It's a wearable device where people can log how they feel during the day and they can use these little you know, icons. It goes from, oh, I feel terrible, to fantastic. And you can see the red one on top is the weekend, so it's not a surprise, we feel much better. <laughs> uh, weekdays, we feel good early in the morning, then it drops all day, and towards 5 p.m. we go back home, so we are happy again. And so, and the, the, the least happy time during the weekdays is 2 a.m. apparently when people have to stay up very late. So you learn interesting patterns of behavior from, from crowds. And this is for 5.6 million mood entries and 80 million night sleeps. How, how would this look like if we were looking at a whole nation and their mood, how they feel? They've done it for the whole of the USA on Twitter feeds, so they can track words and Twitter feeds, all the happy words and sad words, this. And I will show you a video. So this video is, um, I think it's called a cartogram. It's a density equalizing map of America. So the map has been slightly transformed. We'll, we'll, we, I'm sure some of you know that this much better, but what happens with the regions of the map? They change shape if the number of tweets were very high and they shrink if they were low and they change in color if people were less happy they become red the happier they become green so it's from the east coast to middle america to the west coast it's very early in the morning people are not so happy but this tweeting and green and they're waking up or preparing to go to work having breakfast the rest of america is waking up happy and then they start being very unhappy so you can see how it goes during the working day. <laughs> it's lunchtime, I want to be happy. Um, going back to the afternoon, not happy. I'm sure coming, it's time to go home. Maybe some green pops up again. Yes, green pops up again. So you get, you get the idea. <laughs> yes. So all these examples were trying to show you how emotion can be captured and presented and used in different ways. <laughs> now I'd like to talk a little bit about healthy life. Uh, every one of us, health for every one of us is important. And I'm sure all of you have different scare points about health, some more real than others. You know, we all know people or whatever. But one way of looking at this is maybe to look at how things can go wrong, but at the same time, be aware and learn a lot about developments, technology, you know? But at the speed of things going, it's very hard to make sure 
that you know everything is safe and so we just have to go along with it um, if I have well I'll, before I ask you that question the main ill um, related problems are stress and mental problems so they really are the top top two so if I was asking you what makes you stressed what would be your top three things in your mind Lack of time. Traffic lights, because you have to wait. People. People. <laughs> time. More. Conflict. Work. Moving house, don't tell me about it. I'm moving tomorrow. <laughs> yes. Okay, well this is spot on. Um, but the top the top would be um, Here's my slide. Would be work, yes, related to many emails, commitments, phone calls, meetings, projects, computers and smartphones, phones ringing, disturbing noises, um, technology that doesn't work, having to fix things, uh, mess around, you know, people. Um, what else? Yeah, messy environments. So pretty much what will make us stressed. So now the next question would be, what makes you relax? If we want to counteract that, when do you relax? Holiday. Mindful. Very Music. Shiraz. Oh yeah, well. Sport. Physical activity, remember intentional activities, well being, yeah? And your pet. A cat, animals, yes, because you pet them. I forgot to tell you that the act of petting and touching and caressing, actually, they looked into the brain when people were doing that, and the parts of the brain that lit up are the reward and pleasure. So, yes, definitely. Yes, so you spot on, you have them all. And if you think about product and objects that will calm and relax you, a hot mug of coffee or tea, a good sofa, a good book, kitchen tools, believe me or not, music was the top 50% uh, answers. People love to listen to music, candles, so not very, you know, we are predictable as, as who we are. So how does, again, technology catches up with this. How can technology help us relieve our stress and mental health problems? Can it do it? Well, at the moment, there's a whole range of apps. Some better than others, but I could say that maybe a good um, 50 to 100 would be quite good and would be really uh, providing even CBT kind of trainings, um, stress relieving techniques, and, and they do work very well, training your brain and so on. This is good, all well and good. And for designers, there's a lot of role to play here because they have to bring back the human aspect into all of this, not forgetting about you know, all the things we've mentioned. But what happens with the devices where these things are living? You know these devices, they look very like nothing, but they're not too good for us. This is an image from uh, Antoine Geiger. <coughs> he loves to modify images. It just shows how smartphones and tablets are sucking the life out of us, creating social zombies. And it's called total absence in public. And I'm sure many of us can recognize themselves in here. I do it too, you know. It's a refuge from the real world. That's what happens to adults. Smartphones can also be harmful in different ways, uh, especially children. So those of you who have children, you know the amount of time they spend on their computers, on their tablets, on their smartphones, on video games. Besides causing problems with parenting and family life, it's also not very good for their health. If you think of very small children, a study in Australia done, done in 2010 discovered that uh, children born marrow is 10% more absorbent than adults to radio radiation. 
And there's, a, there's research done on it, but no one really comes out and says, you know, what do we do with that? Um, there's a book by Deborah Davis called Disconnect that talks about it. So yes, 10% radiation absorption. And that's not it, because mobile devices, tablets, they need Wi-Fi. And Wi-Fi radiation, also called microwave radiation, you're familiar with this site, the antennas on top of buildings. There's not really much research done on how harmful they might be, but microwave radiation on the long run is harmful. We can design solutions around these. If we are aware, if we know, and if we have a chance, we can, and if there is regulation as well. In Melbourne, there's a university building that has been recently built a few years ago, and they have um, the external facade is covered with this chunky metal, it's not really a mesh, but it's, you know, architects would know the terminology better. Wi-Fi cannot get in, because it, be it behaves like a Faraday cage, and Wi-Fi cannot get out. So because they couldn't have internet, what they did, they put these antennas inside the building. <laughs> I don't want to work there. So we need to be aware, we need to be proactive. As designers, be aware, design around it, find solutions. As consumers of products and goods and services, be demanding from governments, you know, for legislation and for regulation and transparency as well. How could radiation span out in your own home. I have a little story here for you. Uh, my husband is a bit of a techno gig and he downloaded an app that measures electromagnetic frequency radioactivity and we were measuring everything in the home, of course, the television, ooh, it's high, toaster, mm, blah. So testing everything, fine, you expect it from electrical devices. Then the phone fell onto the breakfast table and I had my breakfast knives there and all of a sudden I saw a reading going up and I said, eh, something under the table? No. That was the knives. And I checked all my cutlery, nothing, it's the knives. I did some research and discovered that some governments are selling radioactive metals to companies that can manufacture domestic goods and they end up in clocks, in cutlery and sometimes in jewelry. So I just thought, <laughs> Okay, we need to be more proactive, we need to be aware, and we need to be demanding, again, for transparency, regulation. We need to know where this is going. Okay, so this brings me to the next quote that says, are we part of a large biological experiment without informed consent? I think we are. And I don't think we really have a choice, but we just need to be active, aware, and proactive, really, about it. Because we are in little petri dishes. But having said that, um, technology also has huge potentials. You saw all the health apps, they really work well, they are. But this 3D printing, virtual reality, they really are promising in enhancing human health. So that's an example of a 3D printed nose from human cells. This is really, you know, for someone who has lost a nose, an ear, it's fantastic. Imagine that they can print bones your hip replacement might be a, a real bone one and not a metal thing that you have to carry. So this is really, really promising. And if you think of virtual reality, they already started using it to, tr to treat fears, phobias, post-traumatic stress disorders, uh, and even burn victims. Apparently, pain in, in burn victims is intolerable. And when you put them in virtual environments, the pain feelings diminish. They also use it for surgical training of doctors. And in um, Stanford University, they've seen 40% increase in um, planning time for surgery and 10% increase in the accuracy. So it's all very promising in that sense. But we still need to be alert, aware, curious about all these changes. It can't just be happening to us. We need to have a role to play in them too. Now this brings me to the fourth industrial revolution. This, is, this revolution is quite different than any of the other previous ones because it combines the digital world, the man-made world, and the biological world. They all interact and collide and shape and change each other. What the fourth industrial design revolution is in a nutshell, it's 
the cyber physical systems coming together with the Internet of Things and the Internet of Systems. So basically everything is linked and connected and talk to each other. This also has started to change our ideas about what we think being a human is. And if you look at all the developments in artificial intelligence, sometimes you can have lots of questions. <laughs> but in this part of my talk, I would like also to concentrate a bit on future predictions towards a smarter life, because that's about smart living. And I will talk about ubiquitous technology. Ubiquitous means it's everywhere. It's around us. We don't even see it. It's like air. And the most profound ones end up being like this. And there's one that we know, electricity. We use it for everything. We never think about it, but it's there and, you know, everything works with electricity magically. So now internet is that kind of technology. It's ubiquitous. And the internet in itself, it's the most important human creation of all times. Nicholas Negroponti in 1995 said, Computing is not about computers anymore. It's about living. He could see it coming. <laughs> it took us time to see it. Some people say the internet is the nervous system of Mother Earth. It's a living thing. <laughs> it's almost like electricity. And others said it's the first thing that humanity has built and humanity does not understand. So it's our largest experiment in anarchy. Okay, so, you know, everything connected, everything changing our relationships with people, with things, environments. What does that mean for our limited attention span as human beings? You know, we couldn't, you know, we get confused when there's too much information. It's very tricky. Yes, things, <laughs> they're all connected. So this is a prediction by Cisco by 2020. 50 billion devices will be online and connected happily. So that's the era of interruptive and invasive technology. It's out there in your face, it's over there. So luckily, again, in, back in 1995, Mike Mark Weiser and John Sally Brown talked about something called calm technology and calm design. This has recently been picked up by Amber Case and she produced a book out of it. And two main principles of calm technology and calm design is that technology should not attract our attention all the time. It should come to the peripheries, not be the center of attention. And the second one, it should encalm us. It should inform us, but it should encalm us. We should not be alert all the time. Something is beeping, something is talking to so at least it's good to know designers have resources. And this is closely linked to ambient intelligence. This is a piece of ambient intelligence. It's a little device that big. And yes, my husband bought one. It's lovely, actually. It's a bit like her, the movie, if you have seen it, but not exactly. You talk to her. She has a female voice. And her name is Alexa, and she learns from you. She learns your patterns of behavior in terms of your lighting <coughs> preferences, if you have smart bulbs. Um, she learns your heating cooling preferences, your shopping, the music you like to listen to. And she's sitting quietly. The only interface you have with her is by talking. She responds quite intelligently. It's not like Siri. You don't get frustrated <laughs> with her. Um, it's really omnipresent products and system in the background learning silently. Just imagine Echo, uh, uh, Echo, Echo Amazon linked to the facial recognition and the vocal intonation recognition. She would know immediately how you feel or you had a bad day or you know, and she will put the best music, the one that you love and greet you when you come home, for example. <laughs> but there's also ethical uh, dimensions because everything is recorded. It's part of the data gathering. Remember all the data I've mentioned earlier? I'll also talk a bit more about the data later. But yes, there's that aspect too. But let's look at more tangible, uh, again, technologies. Uh, Amber Case in a TED talk in 2010 said, we're all cyborgs. And she's right, actually. We all have 
external devices that we use, you know, for the purpose of adapting to new environments or to do tasks in a better way. So we have smartphones, we have, and it keeps adding up. Tools as an extension of, of our physical self, but also digital now and virtual worlds as extension of our mental self. But how would real life cyborgs look like nowadays? We do have real ones. Those would be people who have lost complete limbs or division, and these are real life uh, examples. The bottom example is a neurologist who spent almost a year with uh, some chips and you know, uh, electrodes implanted in his brain because he wanted to uh, look at the thought, the way the thought process is happening in the brain and he wanted to digitize it. Apparently he's still processing and analyzing his data. So people are really going to extremes in what, how they interact with machines and devices. But how would that look like with intel artificial intelligence and robotics combined? I have an example here from Eindhoven, from a museum. It's the AB Museum. This is a little robot that allows people who are too frail to go out or bedridden to go and visit the museum. I thought that was lovely. You can go wander around the rooms. You just, you know, guide it with your maybe smartphone. I don't know what they're using on the other end, but it looks like it's a smartphone and an app. And you can ask questions to people. So, you know, it just depends what you do with them. So there's a big role for designers here. Coming back to all the data, <laughs> what happens to that data? Who uses it? What is this big data thing? So what big data is, it's fuel for ambient intelligence. It's for, for ambient intelligent machines to understand humans better and anticipate and understand our needs. So let's look at some examples. This is again an example where people had to wear a special device and move around San Francisco. And what they were measuring is the high physiological arousal and low arousal. So they were looking where people were feeling really low and then really, really, really high. And this is how it looks for San Francisco. So you can see that on the brown areas, there could be some problems about stress, uh, other things happening, we don't know, maybe the area is terrible. This, this information is gold for urban designers, I'm assuming. So, and, and there are also some entries that explain what happened, uh, what, what is the area. So data, depending on how you plot it, is very useful. But what else could we learn from vast amounts of data? Well, we could learn how hard people party. <laughs> this is New Year's Eve uh, through, again, these health devices. So Russia, party very hard. Chile, same. Australia, America, go, bad, go to bed very early. And uh, the countries in grey, I can only assume that they celebrate New Year's Eve on, other, on another day, <laughs> not that day. <laughs> or it's not an issue for them. But what else? Again, uh, this is an example of food intake that people log themselves. What this is good for, you know, you can see, and this is for millions of people, again, you see at what time of the day what type of foods are consumed. So you can ask me who is going to use that information. Well, you know, if you are designing an app for health, it would be wonderful to know that people at night time make the worst choices in food intake. So you can send them reminders saying, maybe instead of that piece of chocolate, you could have a cucumber. You could send them, you know, you can use it. <laughs> so in the long run, what will this range of different data allow us to do? Well, from data, we create wisdom. As human beings, we can turn it into wisdom. And we have evolved as human beings because we can communicate what we found and discover. So fire, once it was discovered, once, it just needed to be communicated. And then we didn't need to discover it again. So it's the same with data. We start with data, we accumulate all of that, we make sense of it, we create information and we share it. We have to share, we have to work in teams. 
We create the knowledge and with experience we build wisdom. So actually the fourth industrial revolution is a good thing. It helps us do all of these things quicker and faster and better. And we will be in a very good position once we have more wisdom. <laughs> so now I'd like to go into the future predictions, you know, with all of this. This is an image from um, Blade Runner, 1982, where the city was this enormous place full of people, big buildings, industries, dark. I think they got the size right. Uh, we really are in the mega cities century, where now they've identified 30 mega cities with this 10 million plus people living. This is all correct, but there's different ways of looking at science fiction, and one of them could be a bit more positive, like uh, William McDonough. They got right that 3 million people move to cities every week. This is happening now. So really, really getting there, mega, mega cities. But at the same time, William McDonough said that the Stone Age did not end because humans ran out of stones. It ended because it was time to rethink about how we live, and it's time now. <laughs> Okay, so predictions about cities, how are they going to be, of course. Uh, and these are, I gathered these predictions from two companies, Samsung and Frog Design, two different, completely different. Uh, they talk about mega skyscrapers, but also mega earth scrapers going down into the earth with huge bases. And I think in Mexico City, they've started the plans for one. Very interesting. When you think of how uh, cars and planes have changed the way we travel, they've ch changed the way we commute in cities, and also how the internet now is changing our interaction, relationships, how we learn. Well, well, drones are coming too. And this is the first drone that has been built in China where one person can fly it. So they are coming, that will change the way we fly around, I guess. And how would we look like, or uh, our interiors would look like? Well, some examples of uh, smart material garments are already tested. They will be called um, IOWs, Intelligence Object to Wear, because they connect to all your devices. So they know if you feel warm, if you feel cold, they get that information and they warm you up or they cool you. Uh, and some even uh, shape memory materials will roll their sleeves for you. I think it's too warm, I'll roll those for you. Thank you. <laughs> um, 3D printing is really now advancing fast. They are printing food at the moment, but this problem with the texture is not quite right there, but it will be right there very soon. Yes, uh, our interiors will be fully digitally controllable, but also as I said, uh, with the mood, the lighting, the heating, cooling, and texture, you could change decor anytime you wanted to, just digitally. And medical diagnosis is going to come back in homes. You can have your diagnosis at home, even have some med medicine supply at home if needed. And the way we grow and consume food, again, will change. We can grow our own organic food, salad, maybe on our balconies, I don't know. And the, the last example I wanted to show you is a, a competition entry for Manhattan. That's a, a tower where you park and station your drone. Interesting. I still believe your balcony is the place you will park the drone. But please remember, these are just predictions. But thinking of the speed things are going, they're not too far-fetched. And some of us in the room may, may be around to see some of them. So to bring this evening to a close, in terms of well-being, we are emotional beings. That's who we are. We are thinking machines that feel. We are predictable. We always seek to build relationships with things, people, events, objects around us. And we remember and seek experiences that are memorable for us. And we seek happiness. And also remember that any object, environment, system is always more than the sum of their parts. They are a set of interlinked experiences. That's what makes us you know, happy, sad, <coughs> or having a meaningful experience. And the finally, having true empathy for well-being is crucial. 
There's no other way to understand people. And in terms of healthy life, it's important to raise our awareness. We have to know about potential ill effects, and, but we have to face our fears and we have to be aware. We have to be in the right mind frame that will allow us to find better solutions and also make us a bit more powerful in how we are demanding what we are demanding from, from governments. And they are stepping in to, you know, regulate the way we behave with technology. They forbid, I think there's fines if you text on your phone while you drive. And there's this Pokemon craze happening at the moment where people catch Pokemon on the car. That's an example of uh, bad interaction, actually. You can have an accident catching a Pokemon. Okay, so for all of us designers, really think about um, how your role has changed or is changing. And as a user, as a normal user of goods and services, think about your responsibility as an aware citizen. And in terms of the fourth industrial revolution, we are more connected than ever, that is for sure. But it's important to look at the future with hope and curiosity and be well informed and proactive once again, because we all have a role to play. We can all contribute to this. And, and things have changed dramatically. It's a, it's a web of relationship that is all different now. So if you think um. as a designer, the role has morphed into this conductor of all these interactions just to make sure that our finite attention doesn't get lost in the way and we can still keep being humans. So the role of a designer is really getting very important because the orchestras they are facing are enormous, gigantic. You have to make sure every device plays the right tune and is not in your face all the time. But as old people and consumers, it's the same. We can all make a difference. We can all contribute to this. The last question will be, to create a smarter life, what would your role be? Thank you.